Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Charles Dickens. Some of you may have heard my name, and yet others of you may have bought and read some of my little stories. At the moment, I'm in the midst of a speaking tour of North America, and here this evening, I'm in New York City, a city that's always been very kind to me. And this evening, I'd like to read to you with as much vigor and energy as I possibly can, one of my own very favorite stories, A Christmas Carol. It's in five staves or chapters, A Christmas Carol. Old Marley was dead. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good in London for anything he put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Mind you, I don't know what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have regarded um, a coffin nail as the deadest piece of hardware in the business. But you will permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole friend, and his sole mourner. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt whatever that Marley was dead. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood years afterwards above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business call Scrooge Scrooge and sometimes Marley. But he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, old Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, covetous, miserly old skinflint. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with friendly looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? No beggars implored him to bestow a coin. No children ever asked him what time it was. No man or woman ever once in his life inquired the way to such and such a place. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Once upon a time, of all the good times in the year, on Christmas Eve, Scrooge sat in his counting house. It was a cold, bleak, biting night. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like just one coal. But he couldn't replenish it because Scrooge kept the coal bucket in his own room. Merry Christmas to you, Uncle! It was Scrooge's nephew, Fred. Bah, said Scrooge. Humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas indeed. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having 
nothing better to answer on the spur of the moment, said, bah, again, and rapidly followed it up with, humbug. Oh, don't be cross, uncle. What else can I be when I live in a world of fools? Merry Christmas. What's Christmas to you but a time of paying bills without money? If I could have my will, every idiot with Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own Christmas pudding. Uncle, nephew, you keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it, uncle. Let me leave it alone then. Much good has it done you. Much good will it ever do you. But uncle, uncle, Christmas is a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem to think of people below them as if they really were fellow human beings fellow passengers to the grave, and not another race of persons bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, although it has never put a scrap of silver or gold into my pocket, I believe it has done me some good, and will do me some good. So I say, a Merry Christmas to you, Uncle Scrooge. The clerk in his cell applauded wildly, Becoming immediately aware of his mistake, he poked the fire and extinguished the last spark forever. Let me hear another word from you, Cratchit, and you'll celebrate Christmas by losing your job. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come dine with us tomorrow, Scrooge said that he would see him in hell first. But I want nothing from you, Uncle. I ask nothing from you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry with all my heart to find you so unfriendly, but I'll keep my Christmas and I'll keep my humor to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle Scrooge. Good afternoon, and a happy new year. Good afternoon. The nephew left the room without an angry word. He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, returned the greetings warmly. There's another fellow, my clerk, with 15 shillings a week and a wife and children talking about a Merry Christmas. He's mad. Two other people came in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands, and they bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, uh, do I have the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead since seven Christmas Eves ago. Oh, we have no doubt that his kindness is well represented by his surviving partner, said the gentleman, presenting his credentials. At the ominous word, kindness, Scrooge frowned and shook his head. He handed the credentials back. At this festive season, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than desirable to make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in need of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? And the workhouses, are they not still in operation? Well, they are, sighed the gentleman. Oh, I was afraid from what you, you said at first, that something had closed them down. I'm very glad to hear it. 
They scarcely provide Christian comfort to the poor. A few of us, a few of us are trying to raise a fund to buy them some meat and drink and means of warmth at Christmas time. What can I put you down for? Nothing. Ah, you wish to remain anonymous? I wish to be left alone. I don't make merry at Christmas time, gentlemen, and I cannot afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the prisons and workhouses, and they cost enough. Those who are badly off must go there. Many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it now and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentlemen withdrew. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened, and the cold became intense. Piercing, searching, biting cold. The owner of one frost-bitten young nose stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. But at the first sound of God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay, Scrooge hurled a lead paperweight with such vigor and force and energy that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and the frost. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house for Christmas Eve arrived. You want all day off tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. Uh, if, if quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop your wages for the day, You'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. The clerk smiled nervously. And yet, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. Well, but it's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But, I suppose... You must have the whole day off. Be here earlier, all the earlier the next morning. Scrooge walked out with a growl, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white scarf dangling below his waist, then ran home to Camden Town as fast as he could to play at Blind Man's Buff with his children on Christmas Eve. Meanwhile, Scrooge took his usual melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern. And having read all the newspapers, he went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a building up a yard. It was old and dreary, for nobody lived there but Scrooge, the other rooms being let out as offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, had to grope along with his hands. Now, it's a fact that there was nothing particular about the knocker on the door. It's also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during the whole of his residence in that place. Also that Scrooge had as little of what is called imagination as any man in the city of London. So explain to me, if you can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face. Marley's face. It looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. And though the eyes were wide open, 
They were perfectly motionless. That and its livid color made it horrible. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it became a knocker again. Now to say that Scrooge was not startled would be untrue. He did pause with a moment's hesitation before he shut the door. And he did look cautiously behind it first. He closed it with a bang. It was very dark, but darkness was cheap, and Scrooge liked cheapness. But before he shut the heavy door, he walked through his rooms first to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, storeroom, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, nobody under the bed. Nobody in the closet. Nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging in a suspicious manner on the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed and double locked the door. Thus secured against surprise, he put on his dressing gown and his slippers and his nightcap and sat down by the fire. He thought again of Marley's face in the knocker. Bah! Humbug! His glance happened to rest upon a disused bell that hung high in the room. It was with great astonishment and a strange dread that as he looked, this bell began to swing. It swung so softly at the outset but soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. The bells suddenly ceased, and they were succeeded by a, a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the cellar floor. Scrooge then remembered that he had heard that ghosts were sometimes described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a bang, and then he heard the noise, much louder on the floor below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still. I won't believe it. His color changed, though, when, without a pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his very eyes. Marley's ghost! The same face, the very same. The chain he dragged was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail. It was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledges, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body, his body was transparent, so that, looking through his waistcoat, Scrooge could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Now, Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no guts, but he'd never believed it till now. Nor did he believe it even now, though he saw it standing before him. Though he felt the influence of those death-cold eyes, he was still unbelieving and fought against his senses. How now? What do you want with me? Much. Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? I was Jacob... Marley, your late partner. Can you, uh, can you, uh, sit down? Scrooge asked the question because he, he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself unable to take a chair. But the ghost sat down in the other chair opposite the fireplace as if he was quite used to it. You don't believe in me. I don't. Why do you doubt your senses? Because 
a little thing affects them. A, a slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a, a blot of mustard, a, a crumb of cheese, a, a fragment of underdone potato. There's more, of, there's more of gravy than of grave about you, whoever you are. <laughs> now Scrooge was not much in the way of making jokes, nor did he feel particularly funny at this moment. To sit staring at those dead, fixed, glazed eyes would terrify anybody. The ghost sat perfectly motionless. Humbug, I tell you. I don't believe in you. At this, the spirit raised an appalling cry and shook its head and its chain with a dismal and appalling noise. Mercy, dreadful apparition. Mercy, why do you trouble me? Man of the world, do you believe in me or not? I do, I must, but why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk among his fellow men and dispense goodness far and wide. If it goes not forth during his life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world, oh woe is me, and witness what it cannot share. You are fettered, your chain, tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will. Is its pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Or do you know the weight and length of the strong chain you bear yourself? It's a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor. But he could see nothing. He thought he might be surrounded by chain. Jacob, Jacob, oh Jacob Marley, tell me more, comfort me Jacob. I have none to give, I have very little time, I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere. Mark me, in life my spirit never left our money changing whole. So weary journeys lie before me, no rest, no peace, incessant torture. The ghost then set up another cry and clanked its chain hideously in the dead silence of the night. But you were, you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business, business. Mankind should have been my business, the common welfare. Charity, mercy, and kindness should have been my business. Hear me, my time is nearly gone. I am here tonight to warn you that you may yet have a chance and hope of escaping my fate, Ebenezer. You were always, always a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you, thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Uh, is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? I, uh, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to escape the path I tread. Expect the first tonight, when the clock strikes one. Uh, well, couldn't I take them uh, all at once, Jacob, and get it over with? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour, the third on the next night, when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and for your own sake, remember what has passed between us. Remember what has passed between us. Marley's ghost held up its hand 
and Scrooge became aware of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret. The ghost joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon that bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window and looked out. As he looked out, the air was filled with phantoms, wandering in restless haste, moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. A few, they might have been guilty governments, were all chained together. Many had been personally known to Scrooge during their lifetime. Scrooge closed the window. He examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It, it was still double locked and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say, humbug, but stopped at the first syllable. He went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep upon the instant. When Scrooge awoke, it was very dark. Scrooge thought and thought and thought, but could make no sense of it. Marley's ghost troubled him exceedingly. Was it a dream or not? Scrooge remembered that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the clock struck one. The bell sounded with a deep, melancholy bong. Light flashed up in the room, and the curtains of his bed were opened by a hand not his. The curtains were drawn aside, and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who had drawn the curtains. He was as close to this unearthly weird face as you are to your neighbor. It was a strange figure, like a child, and yet also like an old man. Its hair was white as if with old age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle on it. Are you the, the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. The voice was soft and gentle. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Scrooge then made bold as to inquire what business brought him there. Your welfare. <laughs> Scrooge said. He was much obliged, but could not help thinking that a night of unbroken sleep might have been more conducive to his welfare. The spirit must have heard him thinking, for it said immediately, Your salvation, then! Take heed! It put out a strong hand, and as it spoke, he said, Rise and walk with me. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was strong and led him towards the window. Scrooge was horrified. I, I am a mortal and, and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand and you will be upheld. As the words were spoken, they passed clean through the wall and stood upon an open country road with the fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Good heavens! Good heavens! Uh, I was bred in this place. Uh, I was a boy here. Your lip is trembling. And what is that moisture upon your cheek? Do you remember the way? Remember it? Uh, I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. Let us go on. They walked along the road. 
Scrooge recognizing every gate and post and tree. Some shaggy ponies were now seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs. All these boys seemed in high spirits. These are but shadows of the past. They have no consciousness of us. The ponies came on with the jolly travelers upon their backs. And as they came, Scrooge knew and named every one of them. Why was he so happy to see them? Why did his cold eyes glisten with tears to see them? Why was he, why was he filled with gladness when he heard them shout Merry Christmas to each other as they parted to go home? The school is not yet deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Scrooge said that he knew it, and he sobbed. They soon approached an old mansion of dull red brick. They entered a long, bleak, bare room full of plain, ramshackle old desks. At one of these, a lonely boy sat reading near a feeble fire and Scrooge sat down on a bench and wept to see his poor forgotten self. I wish, I wish, but it's too late now. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should, I should like to have given him something, that's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and said, let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at these words, and his room became darker and more dirty. There he was, alone again, when all the other boys had gone home for the Christmas holidays. The door opened, and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in and put her arm around his neck and kissed him. My dear, dear brother, I've come to take you home, to take you home, home, home. Home, little fan? Yes, home forever and ever. Father has sent me in a carriage to take you home, and you're never to come back here again. <laughs> but first, first we're to be together all the Christmas long, and have the merriest time in all the world, the merriest time in all the world, the merriest time in all the world. You're quite a little woman now, Fan, my dear sister. My dear, dear little sister. The ghost said, Your sister was always a delicate creature, but she had a large, loving heart. So she had. You're, you're right. You're right. I will not deny it, spirit. She died a young woman, but had, I think, one child. Yes. Yes, uh, my nephew, uh, Fred. They moved on and stopped at a certain warehouse door. The ghost asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? Know it? I was an apprentice here. They went in. At the sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind a high desk, Scrooge shouted in high excitement, Why, it's old Fezziwig! <laughs> old Fezziwig, bless his heart, it's old Fezziwig alive again! Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, and laughed and laughed and laughed. He called out in a jovial voice, Yo ho, me boys! Yo ho, me boys! Ebenezer! Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came running in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, there he is again. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Oh, poor, poor Dick. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Yo, homie boys, cried Fezziwig. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas Ebenezer. <laughs> Let's have the shutters up. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three. 
had them up in their places, four, five, six, barred them and pinned them, seven, eight, nine, and came back before you could have counted to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hilly ho! cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from his high desk. Let's clear away. We need lots of room here, lots of room. And clear away they did. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse became as snug and as bright as a ballroom. In came a fiddler who went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra pit of it. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, followed by their six young admirers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women who worked in the business. In came the housemaid and the cook with their particular young men. In came the boy from across the street who was suspected of not having enough food from his master. Away they all danced, 20 couples at once, down the middle and up again, round and around in affectionate groupings. On and on they danced. Old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done, well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a mug of beer. But scorning rest, he immediately began again. There were more dances, and there were games, and there were more dances still. And there was cake, and there was cider, there was a great piece of cold roast beef and another of pork. There were mince pies and plenty of hot rum punch. But the great event of the evening came when the fiddler struck up the old tune, Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood up to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. And off they went. And when they had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, hold hands with your partner, bow and curtsy, thread the needle and back again, the two were so happy when they got back to their places, but they could hardly stand up. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. The Fezziwigs took their station, one on either side of the door, and wished everyone a Merry Christmas. When everyone had retired, the two apprentices were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits with pleasure. His heart and soul were in the scene. He remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation. He suddenly became aware of the ghost looking at him. This was a small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. A small matter? Yes, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves praise like this? Ah, it isn't that. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to, to render us happy or unhappy, to, to make our service light or burdensome. What is the matter? said the ghost. Nothing, oh, nothing, nothing in particular, no. I should just like to be able to say something to my clerk, Bob Cratchit, just now, that's all, that's all. The ghost smiled yet again. Scrooge and the ghost stood side by side in the open air once again. My time grows short, said the ghost. Quick! Again, Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. His face had begun to wear signs of care and avarice. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in his eyes. He was not alone, but he sat by the side of a fair young woman in a pretty dress, in whose eyes 
there were tears which sparkled in the light. It matters little, she said softly. To you, very little indeed. Another idol has displaced me. I hope it will make you happy. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. There is nothing, absolutely nothing worse than poverty. You fear the world too much. I have seen all your noble hopes fall off one by one until the master passions gain and profit obsess you. I've not changed towards you, have I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy. Yes, yes, I've thought of that. But if you were free today, would you choose a poor girl like me? I think not. So, I release you with a heavy but full heart because of the love that we once shared. He was about to speak, but with her head turned away from him, she said, May you be happy in the life that you have chosen. She left him, and they parted. Spirit, spirit, show me no more. Take me home. Why do you delight in torturing me? One shadow more. No more, no more. Spirit, no more. I wish no more to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and another place. A room not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so much like the last that Scrooge thought it was the same, until he saw her, now a comely matron, sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in the room was perfectly tumultuous, for there were more children there than Scrooge could count. There was much laughter. There was a commotion at the door, and in came the father, laden with Christmas presents. Then the shouting and struggling began with the defenseless father. The shouts of wonder and delight with which each package was received the joy and gratitude. In time, the children and their emotions got out of the parlor and up the stairs to bed. And now Scrooge looked on more closely than ever when the master of the house sat down at his fireside with his lovely wife and daughter. And then he thought that such a creature, quite as lovely and graceful, might have called him father and been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life. His eyes became very moist indeed. Belle, said the husband, I saw an old friend of yours today, Mr. Scrooge. I passed his office window and as he had a candle inside I could hardly avoid seeing him. His partner lies on the point of death, I hear, and yet there he sat alone. He's quite alone in all the world, they say. Spirit, spirit, remove me from this place. I told you these are but shadows and events that have been in the past. They are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me, remove me. I, I cannot bear it. Leave me, leave me. Take me back, haunt me no longer. The spirit faded slowly away. Scrooge was conscious of being totally exhausted. He was overcome by an irresistible drowsiness and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy, heavy sleep.
Awaking in the middle of a prodigiously loud snore, Scrooge had no need to be told that the bell was again on the stroke of one. He pulled the bed curtains aside and established a sharp lookout all around the bed. He did not wish to be taken by surprise by the next ghost. Scrooge was ready for anything and nothing but a, a baby rhinoceros would have surprised him very much. He sat upon his bed at the very centre of a blaze of light which seemed to be coming from an adjoining room. He got up softly and shuffled to the door in his slippers. A strange voice bade him enter. He obeyed. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living greenery that it looked like a perfect forest. A mighty blaze roared up the chimney. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long strings of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, immense cakes and seething bowls of punch. Upon this couch there sat a, a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a, a glowing torch and held it high above his head to shed a light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, man. Come in and get to know me better. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. It was clothed in one simple deep green robe bordered with white fur and on its head it wore a, a holly wreath set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, as free as its genial face. Ha, you've never seen the like of me before. Uh, never, never, no. You have never walked upon the earth with my older brothers, for I am very young. Um, I don't think I have. Um, have, you, um, have you had many brothers, uh, Spirit? More than 1,800, said the ghost. Oh, a tremendous family to care for, uh, said Scrooge. Spirit, spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night, and I learned a lesson that is working now. Tonight, if you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Away they went, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning. The weather was severe, and people were scraping the snow from in front of their dwellings. The people shoveling were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another and throwing snowballs. Oh, the poultry and the fruit shops were radiant in their glory, and the grocers Oh, the grocers, the blended scents of tea and coffee were so delicious to the nose. The raisins were so plentiful, the almonds so white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, and the other spices so, so fragrant. But soon the steeple bells called good people to church. and they came flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their jolliest faces. At the same time, there emerged from back streets hordes of people carrying their Christmas dinners to baker shops to have them cooked in their vast ovens. The sight of these poor revelers interested the spirit very much, for he stood beside Scrooge in a baker's doorway and, taking the covers off as the bearers passed, sprinkled sparks from his torch onto their dinners. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice, when there were angry words between some of the dinner carriers who had jostled each other or tried to jump the queue, he shed a few sparks on them from it, and their good humour was restored immediately, for they said it was 
A shame to quarrel at Christmas time. And so it was. God love it, so it was. They went on, invisible as before, into the suburbs of the town. The spirit led them straight to Scrooge's clerk's house, and at the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless poor Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinklings of his torch. Inside, they saw Mrs. Cratchit dressed poorly in a frayed gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap and make a great show for sixpence. She spread the tablecloth, assisted by Belinda, second of her daughters, while her son Peter plunged a fork into a saucepan of boiling potatoes. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that they had been outside the baker's shop and they'd smelt the goose that they knew was their own, basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion these young cratchits danced wildly round and round the table here's father coming in now they shouted here he comes oh there's such a goose father you've never seen such a goose in came little bob cratchit with at least three feet of white scarf dangling down before him his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and his leg was supported by an iron frame. The two young Cratchits hustled off Tiny Tim and carried him to the wash house to see the Christmas pudding boiling in the large copper kettle. And uh, how did little Tiny Tim behave at church? asked Mrs. Cratchit. Bob smiled bravely. As good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting all by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hopes the people saw him in the church because, because he was a cripple. And it might be good for the people to remember on Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men to see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told him this, and it trembled even more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing more strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim to his stool beside the fire. Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, mix some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, then stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer. Peter Cratchit and the two young Cratchits went to fetch the goose from the bakers, and they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon compared to which a black swan was very ordinary. And in truth, in that household, it was. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with great energy. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody not forgetting themselves, and crammed spoons into their mouths lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him at the head of the table. Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and shouted very feebly, Hurrah! Hurrah! At last the plates were set out and grace was said. There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Everyone had had nearly enough and the youngest Cratchits were steeped to the eyebrows in sage and onion. Mrs. Cratchit left the room to fetch in the Christmas pudding. She soon came back 
flushed but smiling proudly with the pudding like a speckled cannonball ablaze in burning brandy. Oh, a wonderful pudding. Bob said it was Mrs. Cratchit's greatest triumph since their marriage. She blushed proudly. Nobody, nobody even whispered that it was a very small pudding for such a large family. No Cratchit would have ever mentioned such a thing. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the fire and at Bob's elbow stood the family silver and glassware, which were two chipped tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot toddy, however, as well as any golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks, while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed a toast. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us all. Which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, cried Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his. He loved his little son and wished to keep him by his side forever and dreaded that he might ever be taken from him. Spirit, Spirit, said Scrooge, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, nobody will find him here. But if he is going to die, he had better do it quickly to decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head in shame to hear his own words quoted back to him, and he was overcome with grief. Man, if man you be, give up that wicked nonsense until you have discovered what the surplus population is and where it is. It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke and cast his eyes upon the ground. But he was now surprised to hear his own name in that poor Cratchit household. Let's drink a toast to Mr. Scrooge, the founder of this feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, said Mrs. Cratchit. I wish I had him here to give him a piece of my mind. Merry Christmas. I'll give him a merry old Christmas. My dear, Christmas Day, the, the children. I'll drink a toast for your sake and the children's, not for his. He's a hard-hearted, stingy, unfeeling, odious man, Robert, and you above anybody should know it. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to him. I hope he enjoys it, though I know he won't. The children drank the toast after her, but the mention of Scrooge's name had cast a shadow on the party, which lasted for a full minute. There was nothing very remarkable in all this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were leaky, their clothes were threadbare, but they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another and content. At parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and particularly on Tiny Tim. Scrooge and the ghost traveled on. It was a great surprise to Scrooge to hear the hearty laugh of his nephew Fred, and to find himself in a bright, cheerful, gleaming room, with the spirit beside him looking at the nephew with beaming approval. <laughs> Laughed Fred. <laughs> Uncle 
Uncle Scrooge, Uncle Scrooge said that Christmas was a humbug and he believed it. He's a comical old fellow, but not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offences carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. His wealth is of no use to him. He don't do any good with it. He don't make himself comfortable with it. Who suffers from his ill will? Nobody but himself. After tea, they had some music, for they were a musical family, and they knew what they were about. But then they played at forfeits and blind man's buff. There must have been 20 people there, young and old, and they all played along, and so did Scrooge, for wholly forgetting that he could not be seen or heard, he played and laughed along with the best of them. The ghost was greatly pleased to see him in this mood, but when Scrooge begged to stay, the ghost said that it could not be done. Is your Uncle Scrooge coming? Someone said. I don't think so, but he has given us lots of merriment, so let's drink a toast to Uncle Scrooge, however miserable he might be. Here's a glass of mulled wine. So, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to Uncle Scrooge. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge! Uncle Scrooge, they all drank. Uncle Scrooge himself had become so jolly and so light-hearted at all this that he would have toasted them back and given an inaudible speech if the spirit had given him time, but they were again upon their travels. Much they saw and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with the happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouses, hospital, in jails, in miseries, every refuge, the spirit left his blessing and taught Scrooge his lesson. It was a long night, and it was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered, the ghost got older, clearly older, and his hair was now silvery white. Uh, are spirits' lives short? asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. Forgive me, but I see something strange not belonging to yourself, protruding from the bottom of your robe. Is it a foot or a, or a claw? Look here, said the ghost. From the foldings of its robe, the spirit brought out two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt at its feet and clung tightly to its garment. Oh, man, oh, man, look here, look down here. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meager, scowling, wolfish, where graceful youth should have filled their features out a stale and shriveled hand like that of old age had pinched and twisted them. Where angels might have sat, devils lurked and glared out menacingly. No perversion of humanity had monsters half so horrible. Scrooge started back appalled. He tried to say they were fine children, but the words choked him. Spirit, spirit, are they yours? They are mankind's, and they cling to me. This boy is ignorance, and this girl is want. Have they no refuge or resources? said Scrooge. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? said the ghost. 
The bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost, but it had gone. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, he beheld a solemn phantom draped and hooded in black, coming like a mist along the ground, oozing its way towards him. The phantom slowly, silently approached. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched bony hand. Am I in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come? The spirit answered not but pointed onward with its hand. You're about to show me uh, shadows of the things that have not yet happened, but will have happened in the future? Is that so, spirit? No answer. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any spectre I've seen so far. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply, but the bony hand was pointed straight ahead as before. The phantom moved slowly away and Scrooge followed in the shadow of its robe. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, but there they were, right beside the stock exchange. The spirit stopped beside one little group of businessmen and Scrooge drew near to listen to their talk. No, no, said one fat man with an enormous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know that he's dead. Well, when did he die? said another. Oh, last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. Oh, God knows, said the first with a yawn. <laughs> What's he done with his money? asked a red-faced man. Well, he hasn't left it to us, and they all laughed. <laughs> it's likely to be a very cheap funeral, for I don't know of anyone who's going to wish to go to it. <laughs> Why don't we all volunteer to go, as long as a free lunch is provided? <laughs> Another general laugh, and they all parted. Now Scrooge was surprised that the spirit should attach importance to this conversation. They could scarcely be talking about the death of Jacob Marley because his death was in the past and this ghost was concerned with the future. Nor could he think of anyone in his circle for whom this conversation might have been appropriate. They entered the stock exchange and Scrooge looked about in that building for an image of himself in his usual corner. And although it was his usual time for being there, he could see no shadow of himself among the crowd. They left the busy scene and went into an obscure, filthy part of the town where Scrooge had never penetrated before. The streets were foul and narrow, the shops and houses wretched, there's people half naked, drunken and ugly, alleyways and doorways smelling like cesspools disgorge their offensive smell and dirt upon the streets, and the whole quarter reeked of crime and filth and misery. They entered a dingy shop where iron old rags, bottles and bones were bought and sold, sitting among this junk by a charcoal stove was a grey-haired old rascal of seventy years or so, smoking a pipe, who had screened himself off from the cold air with a curtain made of tattered rags. 
Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, quickly followed by a man in a faded black suit. They were all surprised to see each other. <laughs> After a moment of blank astonishment and mutual recognition, <laughs> they all laughed. <laughs> the cleaning lady, <clears throat> the laundress, and the undertaker's man. Look here, old Joe, look here, if we haven't all free, met him without meaning it. <laughs> the woman who had spoken threw her bundle down on the floor and sat on it. She looked defiantly at the other two. What have it then? What have it, Mrs. Dilber? Everybody has the right to take care of themselves. He always did. That's true, that's true, no man more so than him. Why then, don't stand there staring at me. Who's the wiser? We're not going to tell on each other, are we, surely? No, indeed, said Mrs. Dilber and the undertaker's man together. We should hope not, we should hope not. Very well then, very well, that's enough. Who's the worse for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, surely? Why wasn't he nice in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him after he was dead, instead of lying gasping out his last breath all alone by himself. It's a judgment on him, a judgment. We knew pretty well we was helping ourselves. We knew pretty well we was helping ourselves before we met here. It's no sin. Open his bundle, Joe. The man in faded black produced his plunder. It was not extensive. A pencil case, a pair of sleeve buttons, and a brooch of no great value were all. <coughs> they were examined and appraised by old Joe, who chalked up on the wall what he was prepared to pay for each. That's your account, and I won't give you another sixpence. Who's next? Mrs. Dilber was next. A few sheets and some towels, some old clothes, two old silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few odd boots. Her account was stated on the wall in the same manner. <coughs> and now, undo my bundle, Joe, said the first woman. And Joe went down on his knees and dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark fabric. What do you call this then? Bed curtains? You don't mean you took them down, wings and all, with them lying there? Yes I do, yes I do, why ever not? Are these his, are these his blankets? <laughs> Whose else's do you think they are? He isn't likely to get cold without them now, is he? <laughs> he, d he didn't die of anything catching, did he? Joe continued his examination. Ah, you may look at that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find any holes in it or any threadbare places. It's the best he had, and they'd have wasted of it if it hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting of it? said Joe. Putting it on him to be buried in, of course. Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. He viewed this little group of scavengers as if they had been obscene demons marketing the corpse itself. <laughs> laughed the same woman when old Joe produced the money to pay them all. <laughs> this is the end of it, see? <laughs> he frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us all when he's dead. <laughs> Spirit. Spirit, said Scrooge. I see, I, I see now. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. <laughs> Merciful heaven! 
What's this? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay a something covered up on the bed, unwept, uncared for, lay the dead body of a man. Scrooge glanced at the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed at the head of the corpse. Scrooge looked upon this draped mystery corpse. Avarice, hard dealing, griping cares. These had brought him to this end, he thought. The body lay in the dark, empty house. A cat was tearing at the door, and there was the sound of gnawing rats beneath the floorboards. What they wanted in this room of death, Scrooge did not dare to think of. Spirit, spirit, this, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I, I shall not ignore its lesson. Trust me, trust me. Let's go, let us go. But if there is a person in this town who feels any emotion at this man's death, please show him to me, spirit. I beseech you. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment, like a curtain, and withdrawing it, revealed a room by daylight where the mother and her children were. She was expecting someone. She glanced at the clock. She tried, but in vain, to work at her sewing. Someone come. She hurried to the door to greet her husband, a man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. There was a remarkable expression on it now, a kind of serious delight of which he was ashamed and which he struggled to suppress. She asked him what news he had. He appeared embarrassed how to answer. Is it good or bad? Are we quite ruined? No, there is hope yet, Caroline. Uh, if he relents, there is. Nothing is past hope if he relents. He's past relenting. He's dead. She was a mild, patient, kindly woman. But she was thankful in her soul to hear of this death, and she said so with pleasure. She prayed for forgiveness the next moment and was sorry that she had showed the emotions of her heart. To whom will our debt be transferred? She said. Nobody, my dear. We are free. We may sleep tonight with light hearts, Caroline. Yes. Their hearts were lighter, and it was a happier house because of that man's death. The only emotion that the event caused was one of pleasure. Spirit, spirit, let, let me see some, some tenderness connected with a death, any death, or that dark chamber with the unknown corpse will, will haunt me forever. The ghost conducted him through several streets, and they entered again into poor Bob Cratchit's house. They found the mother and children seated round the fire. It was quiet, very quiet. The usually noisy little Cratchits were quiet as statues. The mother laid her needlework upon the table. It must be near time for your father to come home, but I think he's been walking a little slower these last few days. I have made him walk with, with Tiny Tim on his shoulders, very, very fast indeed, but he was so very light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble, no trouble. Oh, who is your father coming in now? She hurried out to meet him, and in came little Bob in his long white scarf. Then the two young Cratchits 
got on his knee and laid each child a little cheek against his face, as if to say, Don't mind it, Father. Don't mind it. Don't grieve. You went there today then, Robert? said his wife. Yes, my dear. Yes. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to, to see how green a place it is and how, and how quiet. But you'll see it often. I promised him that we would walk there on Sundays. On Sundays. Oh, my, my little child. My, my little boy. My little child. <laughs> He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it, poor fellow. He couldn't help it. He left the room and went upstairs to the room above. It was lit cheerfully and hung with Christmas. There was a chair set close beside the dead child. Bob sat in it, and when he had thought a little and composed himself, he kissed the little face. He was reconciled now to what had happened, and went downstairs again quite calm. Bob drew his family about him at the fire and said, I'm sure that none of us will forget poor tiny Tim and how patient and mild he was. <laughs> oh, he was only a little child. His wife kissed him, the little Cratchits kissed him, and the older children kissed him. Oh, spirit of tiny Tim, thy childish essence was from God. Spectre, Spectre, said Scrooge, something tells me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I, I know not how. Tell me who that man was that we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him away as before, and they found themselves at an iron gate, a churchyard. Here then, the wretched man whose name he was about to learn lay underneath the ground. It was a seedy place, walled in by dismal buildings, overrun by grass and weeds, a place of death choked up with too much burying. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed to one particular one. Scrooge advanced towards it, trembling. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the, the shadows of what will be? Or are they the shadows of what may be only? The spirit was as silent as ever and pointed the bony finger downward towards it. Scrooge crept towards the spot, still trembling, and following the finger read upon the stone of the neglected grave the name Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, spirit, 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 am I the man who lay upon that bed? The finger pointed from the grave to Scrooge and back again. No, spirit, no, no, spirit, hear me. I'm not the man I was. Why show me all this if I'm beyond all hope? Good spirit, good spirit, assure me I may yet I may yet change these shadows that you have shown me by, by an altered life. 
I will not shut out the lessons I have learned. Oh, tell me, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the shape of the phantom's robe and hood. It shrunk, collapsed, dwindled down, and changed into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own, the room was his own, and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. Oh, oh, Jacob, Jacob Marley, heaven and Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. He was glowing with his good intentions, and his face was wet with tears. Oh, everything is here. <laughs> I am here. The shadows, the shadows of the future may be prevented. They will be. I know they will. I, I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather. I'm as happy as a lark. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. <laughs> I'm as giddy as a drunken man. A merry Christmas to everyone. A merry Christmas to the whole world. There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. There's the corner where the ghost of Christmas present sat. There's the window where the, the wandering spirits went. It's all true. It all happened. <laughs> really, for a man who'd been out of practice for so many years, it was a splendid laugh, a magnificent laugh. I don't know what day of the month it is. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. I, I'm quite a baby. <laughs> never mind, never mind. I, I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. Oh, glorious, glorious. He ran to the window and put out his head. No fog, no mist. Clear, bright, stirring, cold, golden sunlight, sweet, fresh air, merry bells, oh, glorious, glorious. What's today? shouted Scrooge down to a boy in the street. I? What, what's today, my fine fellow? To die? Why, oh, it's Christmas day, of course. It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. <laughs> they can do anything. They like, of course they can, of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do, do you know the, uh, the poultry shop in the next street on the corner? Uh, I think so. An intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've, they've sold the huge prize turkey that they, they had hanging up there? Well, the turkey, what was it, big as me? <laughs> what a delightful boy. Yes, it's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my boy, yes, my boy. If it's hanging there still, go and buy it for me. You what? You what? No, no, I'm serious. Go and tell him to bring it here, so I can tell him where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back in less than five minutes and I'll give you five shillings. The boy was off like a shot. <laughs> I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. He won't know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. He went down the stairs to wait for the poultry man. As he stood there, waiting his arrival, the door knocker caught his eye. I shall love it as long as I live. I scarcely looked at it before. 
What an honest expression it has on its face. It's a wonderful knocker. Ah, here's the turkey. Hello, greetings. How are you? Merry Christmas to you, sir. The great turkey had arrived. It was a turkey. It could never have stood on its own legs, that bird. Why, it's impossible to carry that to Camden Town. You must have a cab. <laughs> the chuckle with which he said this, and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey and the cab, and the chuckle when he paid the boy, were only to be exceeded when he sat down breathless in his chair and chuckled till he cried. Scrooge dressed himself in his best and went out into the streets where, walking with his hands behind him, he smiled at everyone who passed. He looked so pleasant that three or four good-humoured fellows said to him, Good morning, sir. Good morning to you. A Merry Christmas. And Scrooge said often afterwards that these were the loveliest words that he'd ever heard. He had not gone far when, coming towards him, he saw the portly gentleman who had been in his office yesterday looking for contributions for the poor. My dear sir, said Scrooge, how do you do? Uh, I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was, it was very, very kind of you. Uh, a Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, that is my name, and I, I fear that it is not pleasant to you. Uh, allow me to beg your pardon, and uh, will you have the goodness? And here Scrooge whispered in his ear, Lord bless me, Lord bless me, my dear Mr. Scrooge, are, are, are you quite serious? I, are, are, are you ill? Quite serious, sir, and... Not a penny less, if you please. A great many back payments are included in it. Will you do me that favor, sir? My dear Mr. Scrooge, I, uh, I don't know what to say. Don't say anything. Just come to see me for my contribution, please. And thank you, thank you, 50 times over. And God bless you, sir. He went to church and walked around the streets. He patted children on the head. He found that everything could give him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to dash up and knock on the door. Uh, Fred, said Scrooge. Uh, Merry Christmas to you, Fred. Why? Bless my soul, uh, who's that? Uh, it's me, uh, your Uncle Scrooge. Uh, I've, uh, I've come for Christmas dinner, Fred. Uh, will you let me in? Let him in? It was a mercy that he didn't have his arm shaken off. He was at home and welcome in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. Wonderful party, wonderful food and drink, wonderful company, wonderful happiness. But Scrooge was early at the office the next morning. Oh, he was early all right. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he'd set his heart on. And he did it. Oh yes, he did. The clock struck nine, no Bob. A quarter past, no Bob. He was a full 18 minutes behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in to his cell. Bob's hat and scarf were off before he opened the door. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to bring back nine o'clock. Hello, sir. 
What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? Uh, I'm very sorry, Mr. Scrooge. Um, I am beyond my time. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Step this way, if you please. Um, it's only once a year, sure. It shall not be repeated. I was, I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to, <laughs> I'm not going to stand this kind of thing any longer. <laughs> and therefore, <laughs> and, and therefore, I'm going to raise your salary. <laughs> Bob trembled and got a little closer to the door. For a moment he thought of knocking Scrooge down, holding him and calling to the people in the street for help and a straitjacket. A Merry Christmas, Bob. A merrier Christmas, my dear good fellow, than I have ever given you. I'll raise your salary and try, try to assist your struggling family. We will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a bowl of Christmas punch. Make up the fires here and buy another coal bucket for us, Bob Cratchit, before you dot another eye. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the City of London ever knew. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh. The important thing was that his own heart laughed, and that was good enough for him. For Tiny Tim, who did not die, he became a second father and grandfather all rolled into one. Old Scrooge became loved. He had no further contact with spirits, and ever afterwards, it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well. May that be said of us and all of us. And as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone.